A deep dive into the Gospel of Luke. An overview of the Gospel Canon, Part 1. Learning objectives for this session include the following. To define canon. To recognize a First Testament canon. Then trace the history of the New Testament canon and the history of the Gospel canon. Along the way, we shall identify a few non-canonical Gospels and defend the four canonical Gospels. Canon is a Greek word meaning any straight rod or bar by which any object may be measured. Canon follows three stages. At one point, a book or writing is authorized, that is, recognition by the majority of the respected leaders in a church or community. In stage two, it is standardized. Official recognition is given to the situation already obtaining in the practice of the community. And thirdly, it is theologized. When theologians declare a book to be inspired, infallible, and authoritative. Was there a first century CE canon? We know that Jews accepted the law and the prophets, though the writings were not yet fixed, and Jews largely employed their Greek translation, which we call the Septuagint, abbreviated. LXX. The early Jews, who were Christians, still cited the Jewish scriptures as inspired and authoritative. So, for example, in 2 Timothy, Paul wrote, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Scripture here referring to the Jewish writings. Well, what about extra-canonical Jewish writings, such as the book of Enoch? Well, we know that the New Testament writers never specifically call any extra-canonical literature scriptures, even though they may quote from such. Thus, Jude could quote from the book of Enoch because the Jewish canon had not yet been fixed in the first century CE. Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Apparently, this verse from Enoch is quoted in the New Testament book of Jude, verses 14 and 15. Well, we know that Christians believed the Jewish scriptures, but they had a challenge. How now to be free in Christ while still reading and believing the Torah? Well, different Jews came up with different options. Some ignored or denied portions of the law. Others allegorized certain laws to harmonize with Jesus' teaching. Paul did this in the epistle to the Galatians when he said that Hagar and Sarah, being allegorized, represent the law and the gospel. Others emphasized the pre-law Abrahamic faith as normative. Abraham believed God and God counted him righteous, whilst there was still no law. Then other early church leaders, such as Marcion of Sinope, rejected the entire Old Testament. Others simply redefined the meaning of law, making it some kind of principle. What then was the earliest Christian canon? Jesus himself was the Christian's authority. They then adapted his words and deeds to their local cultures. New Testament writers mostly quote Jewish scriptures as authoritative, 
often citing the Septuagint. Nevertheless, New Testament writings contain about 420 allusions or language parallels with non-canonical Jewish writings. By the second century, however, the early church leaders, whom we call fathers, spoke about the origin of Matthew's gospel. Irenaeus, for example, wrote, Matthew wrote his gospel. And Tertullian, Matthew was the most faithful chronicler of the gospel because he was a companion of the Lord. They mentioned the gospel of Mark. Papias wrote, Mark was the interpreter of Peter, who wrote things down accurately. And Clement of Alexandria, Mark adduced testimonies to Christ, what was spoken by Peter, and wrote entirely the Gospel of Mark. They mentioned the Gospel of Luke. Irenaeus wrote, Luke, without respect of persons, delivers to us what he learned from eyewitnesses. And again, Luke was not an apostle. He followed Paul. His gospel was subsequent to the others. And they wrote about John. Tertullian named the gospels which we possess John and Matthew. And elsewhere, of the apostles, John and Matthew instill faith in us. Thus, from the second century church fathers, we can draw some inferences. In the second century, some church leaders already knew by name the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, of Luke, and of John. They associated these Gospels with the Apostles Matthew, John, and Paul, and further ascribed those Gospels to their authors, Matthew, or to Peter with Mark, to Paul with Luke, and to the Apostle John. The authorities of these books was believed to derive from God who first spoke through the prophets in ancient times, whose words were written down by their followers and guilds, which became the scriptures and are included in the Jewish and Christian canons. God, of course, sent Jesus into the world, who shared his authority with the apostles, promising that they would remember all that he said. So we have then the apostles' writings, which are included in our canon. But the apostles also had their disciples, some of whose writings were approved by those apostles and therefore are included in our canon. By way of summary then, the Old Testament canon in the first century CE, Jews accepted as authoritative, that is, their books written in Hebrew and Aramaic and for a while in Greek. Most authoritative were the Torah, or law, the prophets and the Psalms, and many other, what we call today, Second Temple books, those written between about five centuries BCE and 70 AD. These were not limited to the current Tanakh, or Old Testament, but they would be limited to Hebrew books of the Tanakh sometime in the second century CE, when they also rejected the Septuagint Greek translation. Then Jesus' canon of Scripture, Jesus quoted from 24 books of the Hebrew Scriptures, and he alluded to some 14 other, mostly Greek, Jewish writings. But he especially approved of three collections when he said, Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. The second to fourth centuries canons then, by the end of the second century CE, 
Jews fixed their canon to include the Hebrew books of the Tanakh, having rejected their Septuagint. From the 4th century CE, Christian codices, that is, numbers of Bible books bound together in a Bible, include our four Gospels, plus other books. So, for example, Codex Sinaiticus, copied in the 4th century CE, includes the extra books Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, and first and second Maccabees. Codex Vaticanus includes Tobit, Baruch, Epistle of Jeremiah, Sirach, but no Maccabees. Codex Alexandrinus of the fourth century, Psalms of Solomon, plus third and fourth Maccabees. Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus includes Sirach, a prologue to Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, but lacks some of the books of the Tanakh. A rescriptus document is one which used to be the Bible, but was scraped clean and rewritten with other texts, requiring researchers to analyze the original text using chemical and photographic techniques. We shall try to summarize the canonization process in 20 steps. First, there was the oral tradition in which Jesus alone was authoritative. Secondly, we have the apostolic epistles which functioned as scripture before being designated scripture. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, anyone who claims to be a prophet or spiritual must acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. Clement of Rome, in about the year 95, calls Paul's writings inspired. We shall return to this Syriac document in a moment. Step 4. Some church fathers quoted the Old Testament more than they did Jesus' sayings. Citations and allusions to the four Gospels were common in the second century. Some fathers wrote, It is written, while citing Jesus, making him equal in authority to the Tanakh, the Old Testament. 7. Others appealed to the epistles as authority. For example, Second Peter, when referring to the writings of Paul. Somewhere around the year 160, Tatian published his Diatessaron, which blended the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John into a single account in Aramaic language for the Syrian churches, of which we here have a later copy. This little creature, for the moment, we're going to call a hairy tick. In step 9, Bishop Marcion, who died in about 160, taught that the God of the New Testament was not the same as the vengeful creator demiurge of the Old Testament. He also separated the New Testament gospel from Judaism and from the law, and drew up a list of New Testament books that he considered to be authoritative. Other bishops would later condemn Marcion as a heretic. Step 10. Justin Martyr wrote in about the year 160, the apostles in the memoirs composed by them, which are called gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them. And Irenaeus, some time later, spoke of a canon and coined the phrases Old Testament and New Testament, without, however, drawing up a list of books. In the 1800s, an Italian historian named Muratori discovered an ancient document in the Library of Milan, 
which today we call the Moratorian Canon, first written in Greek in about the year 180, and it lists the following books to be considered authoritative. Probably Matthew and Mark, but the manuscript is damaged at that point. But it does mention explicitly Luke, John, and Acts, as well as the epistles of Paul, including the pastoral epistles, but not Hebrews, James, or First and Second Peter. Probably also First John and maybe Second and Third John. The manuscript is damaged. Jude is there, as well as two apocalypses, the revelation of John and that of Peter, the wisdom of Solomon, and it recommends reading Shepherd of Hermas, a very early Christian document idealizing celibacy. Number 13, a movement whom we refer to as the Montanists, declared themselves to be paraclete, or Holy Spirit-inspired prophets, rejecting John's gospel and revelation whilst advancing their own writings as scripture. The Christian Gnostic movement claimed to have received other secret gospels from the apostles themselves. Thus, because of Marcion, the churches saw a need to expand their written corpus of authoritative writings, and with the Montanists, a need to limit its scope of authoritative writings. In the year 303 CE, Emperor Diocletian ordered Christian buildings and scriptures to be burned. Those who gave up scriptures were called Traditores or lapsi, those who refused were killed and called martyrs. Thus, individual churches must by then have recognized certain writings as scripture. A decade later, in 313, Emperor Constantine I issued his Edict of Milan, making Christianity illicit or legal religion, declaring himself a church bishop. In 325, he called the first council of bishops, and he enjoined upon the bishops to resolve their divisive issues. He asked Eusebius to supervise production of 50 copies of the scriptures, which was completed by the year 336 CE which fact pressed the bishops to agree on an official canon of New Testament scriptures. Constantine himself did not determine the New Testament canon. Step 18, Bishop Eusebius had two categories of books. First, recognized scriptures and disputed books which by the end of the century became the rejected books. 19. Between the years 300 and 400, no fewer than 15 extant lists of authoritative New Testament scriptures were drawn up in different cities. All extant ancient lists either mention the four Gospels or include the Gospels by name Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John.